Some call doubt a sixth sense. Webster's Old College Dictionary defines it as the wavering of one's opinion, a hesitation in one's belief, or to be undecided. Google today defines it as a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction, indecision, hesitation, hesitancy, suspicion, and confusion. I would like to define doubt as the inability to possess all of the facts, to know the complete story. Several years ago, we had a flood here. We've had several floods, but on this particular flood, Jane and I were going out to snook. And we turned on 166, and it was covered with water. And we pulled over to the side, debating whether or not we should go through the water. I was in the pickup. And as we sat there, a little Volkswagen came wheeling by, passed me, slowed down, and headed right into the water. They got about 40 yards, and slowly the water picked that Volkswagen up and eased it over into the fence. After that, I didn't have doubt. I knew. I knew exactly what the situation was. You know, when we, uh, we talk about the, uh, the disciples, one of the things that comes to mind was the element of doubt in their lives. Now, we all know about doubting Thomas, but the other disciples had a degree of doubt in their lives, too. The question I would ask, who were the 12 disciples? What do we know about them? Well, we know that uh, they all responded to Jesus' call. We know that they were all Jews. We know that they were all commoners. And some would say men of simple faith who gave, gave up everything to follow Jesus Christ. We know that most of them were young men, probably somewhere between the teens and mid-30s. And uh, we know that only one was married, and that was Peter, which is kind of strange to me because the Catholics consider Peter as the first pope, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Some would say they were uneducated, uh, and probably by some standards they were. But we know that the Jewish people felt very strongly about teaching their kids, especially when it came to the Torah, their, their Bible, their Old Testament that they followed. We know that they were Jewish families, were tight-knit groups, and they placed a high value on education. Jewish families, in fact, in the first century, liter literacy was very high in Jerusalem and in Israel. Unfortunately, there's a lot we don't know about the disciples because the Bible doesn't tell us. However, we have been able to glean amount of information about their lives from the media and from the, well, I say media, but uh, from secular history is probably a better, uh, a better definition under the circumstances. Ten of the original 12 disciples were, were martyred. They gave their life for Jesus Christ. They gave their life for the church. Uh, yet, only James, the elder brother of John, is the only disciple to have his martyrdom recorded in the Bible. We learn of the other nine other, uh, that were, were uh, martyred from secular history. We know that the disciples were also human just like we are. Uh, they were all self-centered. They didn't get along with each other. One, Judas was a thief who betrayed Jesus for money. You know, I'm beginning to think I'm talking about some of our politicians in Washington. <laughs> but uh, Simon the Canite, Simon the Zealot, was a fanatic. He believed in forcing the conversion to Judaism. We also know that once he converted to Christianity, 
he went forth to cast out demons, heal the sick, and proclaim the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Two of them, James and John, they were sons of Zebedee, went to Jesus and asked, Grant that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in glory. But it didn't stop there. They even got their mother to go talk to Jesus. We're, we find in Matthew 20, 20, 21, declare that your kingdom, one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left. We also know that the 11 remaining disciples after Judas Iscariot uh, went out and hung himself abandoned Jesus when the soldiers came to arrest him. They left Jesus alone, all 11. None stayed around. There were questions, certainly, that the disciples had about Jesus, about the message and all. They certainly had questions about uh, the reasons he had to die on a Roman cross. They didn't under, many of them didn't understand that. They had questions about heaven and would they follow Christ to heaven. Jesus taught by parables and, and was very effective in his teaching. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we find that uh, Jesus spent uh, three years teaching his disciples. But he said in, in John uh, 14, 2 and 3, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have not told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare, prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also be. Now the disciples were all familiar with a traditional Jewish wedding. And if we take these two verses and compare them to a Jewish wedding of centuries past, we know that the prospective groom went to the father of the prospective bride. And he asked for her hand in marriage. And uh, in doing so, he worked out what was known as the dowry. That's the whatever the... Bride's father asked of the groom. Uh, could be money, could be land, it could be a number of things. But once the dowry was worked out, once the father and, and uh, uh, the potential groom worked it out, the potential groom went back to his father's house for the purpose of building a room for his bride. Now when he left, no one knew when he would return. Nobody knew. Her family didn't know. She didn't know. Uh, friends didn't know. The bride had to be ready at all times for the groom to return to take her to his father's house where the wedding would occur and where uh, 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 the banquet that followed would be. She had to be ready. The family would follow but they did not know. Once the wedding banquet uh, took place, there would be a banquet and celebration that could last as long as seven days and seven nights. Uh, I'm not sure how they measured weddings back then, but when I was growing up in Snook, they measured them by the number of kegs. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, had to be ready. And... Uh, uh, the disciples, all being Jews, understood this because there's something else about this message. You see, Jesus went to God and said, I want the church to be my bride. God said the dowry will be your life on the cross for man's sins. Jesus accepted that died on the cross, went to heaven to build a home for the church, for the believers in the church. He said, I will return for the church, for the believers. No man on earth knoweth the time of his return. We know it as the rapture. 
We know it's coming out there. It's interesting to note that every, some in every generation, including many of the disciples, believed he would return in their generation. He's not, and there's a reason. If we read the Bible and understand the Bible, we can see and understand why the return has not occurred. We could also see that we may be living in the last days, but we don't know. The return may come in our generation, next generation. We simply don't know to that, to that effect. But uh, Jesus followed that format, and the disciples understood. Thomas was known as Doubting Thomas. Do you remember what he said? Until I have an opportunity to see the nail holes in the hands and in the feet, and where the spear entered his side, placed my hand there, I would not believe. The remaining disciples, except, it, except Judas Iscariot, all had doubts too. Uh, yet they would see him walk, uh, in, and they would eat with him, they would talk with him in the 40 days before the ascension, and they began to see uh, a light there, an understanding that they had not seen previously. And that's the key. Uh, of the 11 disciples that remained, and if we add Matthias, which was the disciple that replaced, replaced Judas, 11 of those 12 men gave their lives and sacrificed their lives for Jesus Christ and the church. Why the sudden change? Some could say, well, they, certainly they believed. But maybe it's what they saw that was so significant in their lives. They saw that Jesus had actually returned as he said he would. They saw, some of them saw him ascend into heaven, the Mount of Olives, on the 40th day. They saw and they understood. You know, that's one of the things that we look, and by the way, John was the only, only one of the 12 disciples that was not martyred. John was uh, arrested for, for preaching the gospel, was sent to the Isle of Patmos, uh, where he would uh, transcribe the book of Revelations. We know that John also wrote the book of John, John 1, John 2, and John 3, so a pro prolific writer, but he had the vision of God in writing the book of Revelations, and we know that. As a college student, I can remember thinking that it would be much easier to really believe if we would be able to see some of the miracles that Jesus performed while he was on earth. You know, it's, it's wonderful to, to go to church and hear about them. But we all have doubts, doubts about different things. And I said to myself, you know, hey, if I could see something, it would sure help me. What I didn't realize was all around me were things that were happening that I did not realize were miracles. In July of 1967, I spent two weeks at Fort Meade, Maryland. While I was there, the uh, Six-Day War broke out. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Jordan and Syria and Egypt, which surrounded uh, Israel on the north, on the other sides, the south side, Kirk, uh, by the uh, Mediterranean Sea. But Israel was a country of 8,470 nine square miles, very small. By comparison, Burleson County's got about 650 square miles. So when you add that up, you can see that Israel was not that big, is not that big. The enemies, just Jordan, Egypt, and Syria alone were 496 square miles, 58 and one half times the size of Israel. We know the war broke out. We know that uh, uh, what was happening. I remember in 
one of the classes, we had an instructor from the National Security Agency teaching the class. And the morning after the war broke out, he made the comment that uh, those Jews are fixing to get wiped off of the face of the earth. And I thought that was interesting because we know what happened. We, uh, we know that God intervened. We know that he raised up a man in General Moshe Diane, general and commander of the Israeli military. He devised a plan. I'm not going into it here today, but if you're interested, you could sure go and read about that on the internet. He devised a plan that within six days had the enemy yelling uncle. He destroyed their army. He destroyed their military with what he had, and yet we're talking about a nation 58 and a half times smaller than some of its enemies. We're not even talking about Iran and Iraq and the remainder of the Muslim nations. We know what happened. You know, if we read the Bible, we will understand that, first of all, Israel was God's, uh, the Jews were God's chosen people. They are God's chosen people today. And we know that throughout history, when they got in trouble, God bailed them out. They created a lot of problems on their own because they violated the Torah, the laws that God had set forth for them, and God punished them. But he always said, I will retain some to myself. He never let the enemy wipe out the Jews. We know what happened in World War II. We know the six million Jews that were killed uh, in Nazi concentration camps in Europe. We know and we understand that. You can look, one of the best examples is, is Gideon, which is in the uh, uh, Old Testament. Uh, Gideon's uh, basically saving Israel. But there were other things that I really never took the time to realize that were out there. Uh, there are over 300 specific and distinct predictions in the Old Testament alone that were literally fulfilled by Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. In fact, Jesus Christ is the only man living or dead who could have possibly been the Messiah. Among those predictions... The Messiah would be born of a virgin. The Messiah would be the seed of Abraham and the son of Isaac and Jacob. He would be of the family line of Jesse and of the house of David. His birth at Bethlehem, he would be born at Bethlehem and a star would announce his birth. The Messiah would be preceded by a messenger who was John the Baptist. The Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He would be betrayed by a friend, Judas, for 30 pieces of silver. The blood money or price for betraying the Messiah would be cast into God's house and given to the potter's field, a burial site for those who had no money, for those who were poor. The Messiah's hand and feet would be pierced, but none of his bones would be broken. He would intercede for his, personal, for his persecutors. He would be rejected by his own people. His garments would be parted and lots would be cast for them. Darkness would cover the land from noon until 3 p.m. He would arise from the dead and ascend into heaven. These are, these are only 20 of about 300, over 300 different instances in the Old Testament where the Old Testament tells us about the Savior. We don't realize, but, but there are some theologians who say that in every book of the Bible, somewhere there is something prophetic about Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. And that's, uh, that's something that we, got, we have to realize. There are tools that every Christian pr should possess, possess to survive in today's world. Every Christian should take note of three things. The first one is the knowledge of what the Bible teaches. Too many Christians don't read the Bible. 
I was in Dimebox a couple of years back uh, where I'd spoken that particular Sunday morning and as I was leaving and walking down the aisle, uh, there were three or four people standing and I stopped for a moment and in the course of the conversation, a lady said, uh, uh, well, I have a problem reading the Bible because I don't understand it. And I just simply said, uh, do you go to Sunday school? No. How often do you go to church? And she said, about once a month. My husband works, and she had some other excuses and all of that. And, and I, I could not help think, we've got some Sunday schools in this, in this church where you can come in and take the scripture, and you can discuss it. We have some people in our church who have real insight into the Bible. And let's make use of that. Let's turn our church and Sunday school into a teaching lab where we can all learn. The second thing is we must be aware of what's happening in the world around us. That's significant from a number of ways. How many of you are familiar with what's happening in the, East, in the Middle East today? Depending on the media is no longer a viable option. I spend about an hour a day reading various from numerous sites on what's happening in the world around us. I also uh, have apps for both the King James Version and the NIV in my Bible, which, oh, in my iPad, which make it very easy to access the Bible to read. And if we, we just look and see what's happening, we're all aware of, of the Jews being God's chosen people. We know that the Bible tells us that uh, God will curse those who curse you and bless those who bless you. Who is he talking to about? He's talking about his chosen people, the Jews. And that's God speaking. That's God telling us that we need to recognize and bless the Jews. I don't have time to go into it, but when we look at the number of uh, uh, Nobel Prizes that, that the Jews have, have received over the years by comparison to some of their neighbors, it's not even a race. It's not even a contest. We know that, the, that they have made strides in medicine, medicine today, has helped people live. But one thing that's very strange is that we have Protestant denominations today that basically are boycotting the nation of Israel. Why are they doing it? Some would say, well, the Jews killed Jesus. But I think God had a plan for Jesus' life. And I don't think that's a very good excuse because the Bible's very clear. I will honor those who honor you. And I think that's, that's very, very significant. There's an interesting aspect to history. Polit pol political leaders like Adolf Hitler, who wrote the Mein Kampf, laying out his plan for a superior race, or Lenin in the book entitled Communist Manifesto, that provided a framework for a military-dominated socialistic society that we know today as communism. Each literally provides a game plan going into great detail on how they intend to achieve their goals. Mohammed is credited as being the author of the Koran, although he could neither read nor write. Supposedly he gave this information to someone who wrote it down. Tells us that their savior, the 12th Iman, cannot return to earth until all of the Jews and all of the infidels, and that's us, are either killed or converted. And irrespective of what our political leaders and the media tell us, Islam has no desire for peace. They have their marching orders, and their marching orders are to kill the Jews, kill or convert the infidels. Many of us here today uh, old, some of us that are older, saw the movie Patton, very interesting movie. 
George S. Patton Jr. was a foul-mouthed narcissist, but he was a brilliant field general and military tactician. Standing over a battlefield in North Africa during World War II, Patton observed uh, his tanks obliterate the German war machine led by General Rommel. And he shouted out a few obscenities, and then he said, I read your book. What was he saying? I know your game plan because you wrote it in your book, and I've read your book. You know, we have a game plan too, and that game plan we have is in the Bible, and it answers all the questions of what's going to happen in our lives, what's going to happen after we die. It sets that out. The third is what's happening in our lives today, that's very significant. Many of us really don't know and don't realize. Most of you here today are aware of the problems that I faced over trying a capital murder case back in 1994 and the things that occurred. I'll not go into detail here this morning other than to say that uh, it's caused much grief in my life, certainly from a standpoint of knowing the truth and not being able to do anything about it. One afternoon, it's been a couple of years ago, I received a call from the pastor of a church, a church that I'd spoken at previously, asking me to speak. And I said, are you sure you want me? I come with a lot of baggage. And he responded by saying, I know, I know that, and if, it were any con of any consequence, I would have never called you. That's probably one of the most important telephone calls that I've ever received because it made me stop and look at what was happening in my life. In the weeks that followed, the picture became to, began to clear up. I realized that Jesus had disciples with baggage too, but more importantly, I recognize that God could still use me irrespective of what the world might think. I've forgiven those who were less than honest during those hearings and investigations and pray that they will seek God's forgiveness before it's too late. I'm also aware of what it says in Revelations 21.8, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. I love to write, and we recently set up a web page uh, entitled propheticbenchmarks.com. It's a web centered around Christian issues and ideals. But I'm not alone in this battle today. There are many, even some here in this congregation this morning, who are holding back and letting some person or some issue keep them from serving God. Our doubts may not be like those of the disciples, but we all have doubts. And we can't let those doubts stop us in the church. There are reasons for doubts. Sometimes they're very significant in our lives, but in the church is not one of them. Don't let someone back you into a corner and deny you the ability to serve God or his church. We must all realize that God has a plan for our lives and we must follow that vision. We must read and understand what the Bible's teaching. Would you stand please? <clears throat> 